Oh, man. Two in a row. Outside during the day. For those of you who come through podcasting and you keep wondering what I'm saying, it's because typically this show is recorded at night. We got caught a few bird sounds last time. But let's get into it here. This one's going to be called What You Need. And it comes out of a conversation I had with a good friend of mine. And I was making the analogy towards the same entitled episode from The Twilight Zone back in Rod Serling's days. It's called What You Need. And it's about an old man who sells knickknacks out of one of those little suitcases like back in the well, probably from the Depression up. Shoelaces, tonic, a comb, maybe some, a bus ticket. And he's at a bar, and he's just kind of coming through offering customers wares. The first person he bumps into is a woman, and she doesn't know what she wants, but she, he looks into the thing, and he looks at her, and there's something wild's happening, right? Some shine is happening, right? He's seeing something, and he reaches inside, and he pulls out some stain remover and he goes this is this is what you need she was like how much and i think he'd give it to her for free walks over to the bar where this this kind of washed up professional baseball pitchers there and they're talking about the fact that he blew out his arm and he's like you know well what can i do with the rest of my career because nobody wants a guy with busted up arm and so the old man gives him a bus ticket and then a phone rings, which uh, was for the guy who just complained about his arm. Now, the entire time this criminal is watching at the bar, he's at the end. And he's not buying enough suds to make it worth the bartender's time. So the bartender's kind of like, dude, you're going to order some more. You can't just sit here all day, right? And then we get the exhibition of how mean this dude is. He's watching it the whole time. So the guy goes to the... Uh, phone booth that's inside the bar and he takes the phone call and no one can hear it he comes in and he's like oh my god would you would you would you believe it like i just got a call from i think the i think it was the cleveland indians and he says you know they want me to come and do training and he goes uh and he goes why well, oh i got this ticket this bus ticket to go there he looks at the old man and he's like how did you know pops i was like well you know i just had a hunch man so then the guy's like, oh, man, you know, I can't show up like this. I got this suit, but it's all dirty. I got this spot right here, you know. What am I going to do about that? And the girl gets up, and she's got the spot remover. And she walks up, and she goes, uh, you know, I might have the thing you need. And she's beautiful. He's handsome. And so they clean him all up, and then they just goo-goo-eyed after each other. And we can assume that they lived happily ever after. So the old man leaves the bar, and the crook follows him. And he knows the crook's fallen because while he was in there, he looked in the crook's eyes and the old man, as soon as he stares at you, he sees the future of at least the near future. And the crook, you know, he saw the mechanism. He's like, what do, what do I need? What do I need? And I'll let you finish that on Netflix. It's called What You Need. So we're just going to be borrowing sort of, um, I don't know, it's like we're going to take some on-point stuff and turn them into metaphors. But let me ask you, as a foundational statement to this entire episode, do you think anything happens as a matter of pure coincidence? If there is any intelligence to things, which we know we are definitely an intelligent being. For those of us who've had spiritual experiences, we know that there's an ecosystem to the souls and the vessels that we possess. And I can tell you that I've only seen really beautiful things for every spirit that's on the other side. I wouldn't be surprised if we're in a matrix. I mean, nothing really has to make any sense. Like, okay, which shape is the planet? What shape is the universe? It's whatever you think it is, or it's whatever they tell you it is, and they could, they could deceive you in real time, right? I mean, you could be on a... I'm just going to give you a silly analogy. Imagine you're on a flat disc, okay? And you, they want you to believe you're on a ball. And so you take your rocket and you're flying 80, 90 miles, miles, not feet, into the air, and they just round off the thing while you're up high and as you land it flattens back out again i mean they could do that in a simulation it doesn't really matter that's why you shouldn't get so buttered about 
being a nerd who's trying to feel superior to other people. That is a peasant's way of thinking. Okay, digression off. I personally do not believe that anything happens purely out of coincidence, at least in the grand picture of things, especially the inception of such a, an amazing ecosystem. Because as an engineer and an artist, when you see the entire world as an algorithm, you have to understand this is the most deep or bug-free code that has ever been, that we've, that, that, that any consciousness that I think that we have experienced could experience. It's perfect. What's that mean for other people who are new? I have not transformed into a toaster. Um, I haven't transformed into a teapot and then back to me. I haven't changed who I am as a person. My voice is still mine. My identity is still mine. The backyard, even though you can only see a portion of it, has not changed into Disneyland and then back and then to a parking lot and then a rip to hell and all this other stuff. It's perfect. The software runs perfect. If you have ever engineered anything in your life, whether it be physical or intellectual, you will damn well know it takes a lot of planning, a lot of effort, and unless you're Nikola Tesla, you're going to have some bugs. So why bring this up? The reason why I want to lead off with that statement is that I want you to realize your belief, not my belief, but your belief as to whether or not we are in a world that was intended to exist. Now, in terms of determinism, whether or not there is a a big book in the sky that says everything you're going to do. I think that algorithmically speaking, it's easy to see a infinitely dense universe of fourth dimensional existence, meaning time is infinitely dense as well. And yes, everything that this soul that you possess going through vessels and through three dimensional moments in this, this container that we're in, you could choose every possible thing in the next second. If it is impossible for you to get from point A to point B, then you can't have that path, right? So me leaping to the moon uh, would only be possible if in a previous different parallel universe, I actually did live in a world that could get to the moon and I was on a, a vehicle that just happened to have me on this particular day in a different universe on the moon and I would have to do a huge jump to that vessel, push him to this one so he's on the patio and I'm on the moon. That's the only way you can do it. I know I'm getting crazy on you, but there's a point to this. We often ask the question, you know, what's the answer to life, the universe, and everything, right? Which obviously, consequently... Deep Thoughts, Deep Thought, the computer, came up with the answer, right? Go see Douglas Adams, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, for details. We want to know what the purpose is for us to be here. So when we're kids, we see through the eyes of our sort of uh, world that we live in, the ecosystem that we live in, whether you live with your mother and your father at the same time, whether you have brothers and sisters, whether you live in an aggressive part of the world or a more sophisticated first world part of the, the world. But as a parent, uh, or as I should say an adult, you expect to be able to control your life, don't you? If your parents said, hey, we're going to grandma's house and you don't want to go to grandma's house, you know you don't have a choice. Oh, you can protest until your, your butt sings. But you're subservient to others. Adults, most definitely, uh, they get polarized at one point. As you start to go through all your rite of passages, whether you be kicked out to have to deal with them as a, an issue of a mother of invention, or if you choose to leave, like I did, and get in it early, as soon as you gain control of your life, you don't want to lose control of your life. That's the past. Mommy and daddy telling you where you're going uh, that's for the birds, man. Then maybe you marry into uh, your your family and you choose to share the experience with someone else. But just prior to that, let's just keep you single for a second. We don't want to think of the world as a place that gets to control us, do we? We don't want that. I'm in control of my life. Uh, I don't mind there being a purpose to the universe, purpose for me to be here, but the normal hubris and insecurity of man, which is an innocent, beautiful thing, 
on one level, does not want to give up the steering wheel. And we don't want to think that we're on a car inside of a, an amusement park ride on a rail where we would like to get off and go see what the Haunted Mansion really looks like, but we can't. We're stuck to this car. And it's going to turn us left and right, and it's going to shake us, and it's going to wiggle, and it's going to do all this stuff, and we don't have a choice. What's that have to do with the name of this episode? Imagine for a moment that this universe is very purposefully created. For anyone with a, an infinitesimal amount of spirituality, that is a very easy concept to believe. And the more that you are spiritual, and the more that you might call yourself religious, which means you're probably more spiritual than anything, it's very easy to surrender a part of yourself to a supreme level of intelligence that is the entire thing. And I used to think that, okay, it was, uh, well, I used to ask myself the question, I don't think I really had a definitive thought process on it, but I used to think, okay, people who believe in God, are they weak? I mean, I've always believed in God, but I mean, through the religious paradigms, is it just that they're weak people who want to be told what to do? Hmm. Or is there something else bigger to the game? There's a hidden little mechanism inside the mind that we don't talk about at all. And I'm going to give you a word analogy. When I did Woman Wizard with Robert Llewellyn, which was a stand-up comedy routine that we put on DVD and he toured all over Los, uh, uh, England, he has a funny slide in there because he was the cartoonist in there and I was the other artist. He, read, he had read a book from this famous woman who I believe is a British psychologist, uh, but she said that women are good with uncertainty and men aren't. And the main reason why is that a man's phallus is on the outside of his body, so there's no mystery as to what he is made of. But a woman has a orifice where all the magic's inside, and they can't just look down and see it. So looking down and seeing nothing helps your brain deal with uncertainty and still being confident and productive with that lack of knowledge. Okay. I think that when man reaches a point of, I think, therefore I am, consciousness, and starts to count the variables of all the inputs to our senses, and realizes quite emphatically that there is way much more data both the dynamic changing variables of all things, meaning I am probably surrounded by, I don't know, a billion leaves in this backyard between the vines and these beautiful trees I have out here, my elders. There are variables moving, the, you know, the ethereal winds moving these leaves around, right? Those are just the variables. Then you have the actual individual objects that have purpose and form and lifespans. Once you realize just a backyard, if you could truly conceive of a backyard, all the tiny insects, the lizards, the possums, whatever, is so beyond your human capacity to truly conceive. And then you have to think of the rest of the world before you even get to a universe concept. It gets gigantic. And then the next, I think it's, it's almost like our Kubler-Ross kind of thing, right? First step is understanding infinity to a level of understanding that you will never conceive of all things. Yet you live in this infinite cosmos of things that you can't conceive of. And don't worry about it being, you know, universe cosmos, just wherever we are, this reality, this simulator. I'm Cosmo D, yo baby, that's me. Once you humble yourself to the universe, mathematically humble yourself, feel the limited capacity of this vessel, which is your body and your soul creating your mind, your state of consciousness. You understand that within this robot, you can't conceive of infinity. Maybe there's another life form where you could. I have my doubts and I don't worry about it ever achieving that personally. But this catalyzes a belief in a higher consciousness. And why is that? Because this place exists, that's why. This place exists, so something is containing all of this math. Something is containing this infinite 
amount of stuff. In terms of our ability to quantify and, and enumerate what we are seeing and what we're experiencing, it is beyond infinity. doesn't matter your choice of how you interpret the shape of anything. doesn't matter. How does that apply to the show? Well, once you realize that you're inside a gigantic computer of some sort, and you realize that in the normal world, nobody spends any time building anything without a purpose. We don't. You ever just go out back and build a patio for no reason? Hell no. You build a patio because you wanted a patio. Your buddy's got a patio. You're over there drinking a beer the other night. You're like, damn it, I, w I want one of those for myself. Okay. So this place most definitely did not get created out of some laissez-faire, hey, yeah, I'm sitting around here and I created a universe. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and I created an infinite uh, amount of beings in mathematics and ether. I found this stuff called ether. You know the stuff we got lying around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I took that and you know, look what I did. It's pretty cool. Uh-uh. This place is very intentional, okay? All right. So if you're here for a reason, then you're here for a reason. And therefore, we have to think about this. There is probably an infinite amount of gradients, but I'm going to give you three. And I did an episode on determinism, and I've done some recently here too. But either you're in a pure world of chaos, which makes no sense, in my opinion. Or you're in a pure deterministic world. Everything's been thought out for you. You're just really kind of a useless breathing mass going through a pre-orchestrated pool shot. God does not care that you exist because, hey, he already knows the end result. I don't buy that either for the reasons I just mentioned. But there's a mezzanine between those two. And it's real simple. It's a test. It's a test that is almost as if uh, we could use the word evolution, but the problem is that'll link off to Darwin and a bunch of other bad ideas. But it's literally your maturation, your maturity through this, this universe, this experience that we're in. And the universe doesn't need to waste its time with your existence if it doesn't have a purpose. It has a purpose. Why would anything inside it not have a purpose? A well-regulated Hollywood professional camera, digital camera these days, right? Is never rented out for anything that isn't going to make money. Why would they ever let a camera out that probably costs $250,000? When one... If you're really shooting nothing, then you're probably an irresponsible person who doesn't need money, and you probably damaged the camera in the first place. But two, it should be rented out to somebody who's going to make a movie, make a short, make a television show. I think that your time in this universe is exactly the same. But now when we look at our lives, do we think that we're seeing 100% determinism? Do we think we're seeing purpose, purpose, purpose? Well, sometimes we do. As a child, you are so subservient to your parent, your parental guard, guardians and what have you, you don't perceive yourself as having any authority of any kind, and so you're kind of a pinball in a pinball machine. Your parents are the flippers and the bumpers, the kids at school that bully, bully you or whatever. Going through physical transformations, going through puberty, it's all out of control. If you're a woman and you're having your menstrual cycle as a young girl, you're like, I can't control this. This thing is happening. And if I could control it, I would never let it happen because it's messy. So purpose. Isn't it interesting as you get older, if you are ever to be on a spiritual journey of any kind, that is when you gain your more sentient thought process and you start asking that big question about life, the universe, and everything. Right? That's why I say when someone, I was blessed probably at I guess 13 years old, my father read me the first book of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy so that, uh, let's see, four years later when I got to California, my buddy had the LPs recorded off on cassette. I used to draw video games and listen to this, and it was such a beautiful, comedic, sort of softer, easier, more accessible version of Monty Python through Douglas Adams that it expanded my mind to be prepared for this show in part and then to take it further, right? But imagine this is a test. And so let's say that we agree that this is the test. This is a test. And then you're like, okay, it's a test. Whoop-de-doo. 
What am I being tested for? That's the second question. Even if the first question is handed to you or the first answer to why you're here is handed to you by your version of the creator. Yes, this is a test. See ya. Bye. Well, imagine. This is just pure logic here. There are times in our lives that we can see things that happen to us and it feels like it has a purpose. And there's times when we feel like, what the hell's going on with our life, right? You know, when's this ever going to stop, man? I don't know if I like this. But if you were to pull back and put your eyes and ears and senses and brainwaves inside what the Greeks eventually called the Greek gods of the, you know, the Colosseum, that whole Clash of the Titans thing that was beautifully dramatized where you have a, a stadium and you're down inside there and they introduce things inside there to test you. They could curse you. They could bless you. They could take away everything that you want, like Job, the story of Job. Or he could bless you beyond your wildest dreams and destroy you. So now imagine that your creators are brilliant beings or being. Could be a hierarchy, could be one being. Could be the universe itself is the being and we're simply just little red blood cells running around inside. All right. Then maybe, just conceive of this for a split second. Give it some time to sink in. What if every single thing that you've ever experienced in your entire life, based on a a previous incarnation or infinite incarnations prior, as illogical as it looks when you have your eyes really close to the paper, it is exactly what you needed to get to the next level. If you endorse the challenge of what you need by the universe, then you're potentially, and you can conquer it, you can get past it. Maybe it's temptation. Maybe it's you becoming empathetic and stop thinking about yourself so much. Maybe it's you need to think about yourself because you're only empathetic. Take care of number one because you're not doing it. And they're investing in you to survive, but if you keep going down the path you're going... They're going to be like, well, he or she's not going to exist anymore. So it switches and it changes and it's all dynamic. If you take the challenge, then you get the next challenge. Perhaps it's more difficult. Perhaps it's less difficult. Perhaps it's going up and down. If you don't take the challenge, chances are, mathematically, you're going to compound the problem that you were needing to challenge in the first place, right? So you need to do your homework. You don't do your homework. Now you're behind in your homework. What could be the next challenge? Well, probably for a little while, they're going to challenge you with some more homework. See if you can pull yourself out of this anti-homework path you're in. But it could be, it's like, okay, well, that was to get the promotion or to keep the job that you have. And so now being homeless is the next challenge. Something else. It It was your choice. But you didn't realize it. Uncertainty is a bitch, I will tell you, man. It's a really tough thing to sort of wrap your mind around. And the reason why is that uncertainty means that you really don't have a lot of control. If you had an A-B scenario where, well, tomorrow either this is going to happen or that's going to happen. As much as one might be good and one might be bad, and you don't know which one's going to happen. Well, you're going to try to lean on the one that's good. Now, if you can make both scenarios positive, then you don't care when you go to sleep. But if one could come up and take a bite out of you, that's no fun. But what if, okay, you do get a chance to meet your creator. And I really encourage all of you who do believe in a higher being to practice, preferably in solitude, meaning without distraction. For those of you with giant families and you're responsible, well, as long as you jump in a car at any point in time to go get supplies or go to work, use that time. If the whole family's asleep, use that time. But for those of you who have space inside your, your dwelling, think about how much different your life would be if your vision and version of a creator simply came down and told you what you probably already know.
Because without that little whisper in your ear, you're wondering if you're doing something wrong. Am I doing the right thing? Am I doing the right thing? I don't know. Well, God told me, this is exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. What harm? Yeah, I guess th- there, I'm going to go through this, okay? What harm could there be if you thought that every day of your life that you were being challenged, where normally you would not interpret it as a positive? You did interpret it as a positive. And why? Because you were told by God himself or herself, however you view that, that this is how it works. And then they said, well, just so you know, one, you don't die. Just so you know, your vessel's going to pass away, and people will miss you, and you might miss being who you were, but you have been infinite. That's it. You have been infinite, and you will continue being infinite. So don't worry about this. So now all of a sudden, the burden of death disappears, if that was a concern to you. Well, then life kind of maybe takes a big poop. It lightens up a little bit, right? It gets your bowels lightened up, right? Okay. Now you're looking around going, okay, what did I just learn by talking to God? One, there is a God. Two, God is on my side. Three, I can't die. Four, everything I've been experiencing my entire life is exactly what I needed. Does that mean it's easy? Oh, no. But do you want that? Do you want everything to be easy? Now, I will say, okay, there are levels of the game that I think are absurd. But I don't know, the, I don't know what they've done before. There is a man-made invention, which is called karma, which suggests that you were blessed in one life, and then you were dark to somebody else. And I've seen it happen in my life. The blessed torturing those who are unblessed. My cousin, who's a year and a half older than me, the gentleman I will not speak to anymore. When we were in high school, he's a father, his father's a doctor. He got all the, he got a brand new IROC. He got the brand new computers that he didn't know how to program. But he would go to school and because he's a psychopath and a sociopath, he would throw coins at the short bus kids on stage, from Down syndrome to all these other things, to hurt them. thought that was funny, until a wrestling dude pinned him on the ground and probably should have pounded his face in, would have done him a, would have done him a huge solid out he beat the shit out of him. But he let him off, and so he continued. He nearly killed an old man, throwing some shit off a, uh, an overpass, so you see defective, you know, vessels. Perhaps it's a defective vessel. Perhaps it's just some feral soul that has just climbed out of, you know, something's ass and it's getting its first chance to inhabit the human body. And so it's horrible. So we have this belief that if we're bad in a previous life, then we're going to come back and get challenged. Well, I guess you could interpret it that way. But one of the other ways you could interpret it is you had two children. One of them was just born with 140 IQ, headed towards 180 very, very soon. And then you have the child that was born with a 3 IQ that if they study real hard, they get it to 85, which means they're basically mentally retarded. If they get into the 90s, they'll get violent. If they never take care of their body, well, then they're going to be that squirmy bastard like my cousin who will attack the most frail the, the humans on this earth that we should be protecting more than any other human beings, those that were born inside vessels that didn't work for whatever reason. Some of these people have been abused into their mental states. I'm not sure that's the case. I think it's just you know that you're going to have to challenge the son who's having all the mental problems differently, at a different pace, at a different level of pressure. You're going to have to be careful because you know they're going to fail more often than your brilliant child. And we can't let them feel like they've lost, right? We have to keep them happy. We have to make them, we have to encourage them along the way. We as parents would have to give our child what they need and be dynamic about it. The second that we gave them something that might take them to the next level and they're not interested that particular day because they're having a bad day. 
well, we're just going to have to put that back on the shelf and maybe find something just slightly more interesting, different, less difficult, more difficult. We have to work the game. I can't stress enough that the, the saying that as it is above, so too is it below might simply be the most brilliant statement and the most relevant truth for anyone who's achieving existential enlightenment to figure out how the universe works. Because we can't prove easily the upper construct of intelligence of this universe to ourselves, right? There is no proof of, of a God in the layman sense of the five senses that we have. Most of us have six, seven, eight, nine. We all do, but some of us stay out of the fluoride. We stay out of the toxicity. We use our mind. We challenge ourselves. We have these types of conversations. We recognize that uh, the mantis insect is an absolute proof of a creator. The little dudes have paint jobs that are proportionally distributed to control contrast and focus of the eye. I mean, it's unbelievably brilliant. A butterfly, a moth, it looks phenomenal, right? The fact that a caterpillar turns into a butterfly, unbelievable. So for some of us, we think we can see that kind of thing. But because we can't come up with a unified explanation of a God for all beings, to the point we have no atheists, we have no agnostics, we just have 100%. Well, there is a creator, we just know very little about the creator. As it is above, so too is it below, becomes a tool once that you have vanquished the lack of faith or the, the possibility of God and you make it a determined fact about God. Once you get through that phase of your life and there is no worry about whether or not there could be something smarter than you, because it is definitely, for some, a battle of the hubris. There can't be anything smarter than me. I mean, yeah, there's other human beings that are smarter than me, but we are it. Look how we dominated this place that we're stationed at this moment. Once you get past that, what I would say is a very myopically immature, quantifiably super-regulated view of the world, meaning you don't have that many sockets in your brain to really be here yet. Using your mind and thinking clearly, go see critical thought theory to help yourself out. You'll get there. You will. If you can just not lie to yourself. If you can just for one moment stop looking at your reflection in the water. You'll get there. It is logic. So once you accept that paradigm, then you're like, okay, how is it up there? Versus how is it down here? The specifics aren't really important at all. We live in this beautiful thing called love and metaphor. Love and metaphor is truly an abstract realm of contemplation, isn't it? Why? Because a metaphor is a piece of truth, literally an algorithm of truth, that is so pure and so beautiful, it can be applied to a million different places. Whoever put together the Bible, and however that thing is inspired or uninspired, I don't know of any book on this planet, either past, present, published, unpublished, rescinded out of publishing, that has more brilliant metaphor. The Bible is the bomb. If you seek wisdom and truth in the form of generic algorithms of metaphor that you can apply to algorithms that help Tesla build machines all the way up to how the universe is built, all the way to how do we treat each other as human beings and how do we look at ourselves in the mirror. It doesn't matter if you're an atheist. You would be an ignorant human being to be an atheist and not read the Bible to figure out the lion's share of truth that man has, has conceived of here. Don't get like George Carlin, who I don't know what happened to him in the Catholic uh, schools that he grew up with in Brooklyn. Something happened to him that he spent most of his life hating the church, trying to convert all of his followers to atheists, 
to spite the church for something that happened to him when he was young. Maybe he got raped by some priest, preacher or something. I mean, honestly, it might happen. And so he just goes vindictive his whole life. And for anyone that he convinces not to read the Bible, they lose all those algorithms of truth. It doesn't matter if you think it's real or not, man. I mean, do you worry about, like I just said in the last episode, do you worry about the Aesop fable being real, the boy who called wolf? No. But you probably learned about that truth in the universe of lying to manipulate people, to give you attention before you ever heard of that story as a kid. Once you start quantum locking, okay, your world with the entire universe and understand that just as there's one book of physics for all things, there is one book of spirituality for all things as well. If you can rationalize it and conceive of it as a human being, there is a likelihood that the universe can think of that thought for you as well. What is this all built up to? Everything I've told you has built a paradigm for consideration inside your mind that perhaps everything that you experience on a daily basis is exactly what you need. It is the way, as the Mandalorian would say. I think that once you can think of things like this, the most profound challenges that you could be experiencing suddenly make sense. And it is a roundabout way of saying, you know, God works in mysterious ways. The problem with that statement is, is that cuts your brain off from taking what is actually occurring and trying to truly understand the value of the lesson. What if you were studying to be a, a, a general practitioner doctor, and every time you took a test, all you said was, well, the college works in mysterious ways, so I just need to memorize and repeat the answers in you know, these questions, get the passing grade, be called a doctor, then go to the uh, clinic that you're going to try to work at, and you won't necessarily remember anything because you didn't have any purpose for taking the test because you wrote it off as God works in mysterious ways. Yeah, maybe. You could say that God uh, does things that you don't completely understand, but by having that sort of foundation of interpretation, oh, honey, there's one of those things again. What are you talking about, honey? Well, you know, this thing happened to me day, today and I don't understand it. Well, God works mysterious ways. High five, boom. Let's uh, go eat hot dogs. Instead of saying, hmm, change is, is coming. A lot of people having their lives changed, man. I'm having my life changed on this end due to some obligatory things that are just out of my control. Okay. Well, you can interpret it and fight it. Say, no way. If you have a choice to fight for what you want, uh, I don't know what, what the case might be. You could work really hard and get something done. And then maybe there's a benefit afterwards and you have all the talent and you have all the time to execute against that idea. Then go for it. That's what that challenge is probably all about is, well, you know what? You're in your fourth year of college. I know it's really tough. All you got to do is punch through. And I know the last round of tests you took sucked. But you know, if you stop smoking the weed, stop going out to parties, stop hanging out with kids that are bad influences, and you study, 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 you can get that A. And then this dream you had of this career locks in place, and you're not going to be on Skid Row later on. But if there's something more obligatory, it's out of your control. It is going to take place. Well, you let it occur. You plan for what could possibly uh, apply to you. If it's going to affect your standard of living, well, you need to put a bunch of hard work in to make sure you don't lose your standard of living. Whatever the case might be, however generic, however specific, it is what you need. But now, what did we just say a few minutes ago about the value of the Bible? The value of the Bible and lots of other passages written in other texts that are fictional stories, man. Fables. Read all the fables of the entire universe that you can get your hands on. They all have that same beautiful stacks and stacks of, of lessons and truths. Well, it's important that you look at the challenges in your life as the same thing. Maybe you can't find anything, but if you can find something, then it's, um, it's something bigger. 
part of it is if you're going to experience a big change in your life and you're you know you're not sure how it's going to go part of it is to try to boil up okay part of this is directly my test to deal with this particular situation but there could be a higher metaphor okay and that metaphor could be just as simple as do you trust god do you trust the universe Okay, well, it's nice to say that when everything's going great, huh? Got a nice paying job, economy's stable, there's no inflation, there's no gas prices, there's no war, there's no nutbags running around the country trying to mandate things for you. So it's good. It's a good time. So there's no challenges anywhere, necessarily. I mean, there's little micro ones all day long. And so you say to your friend, well, I love God and I trust the universe and I trust Jesus or whatever, Muhammad, whatever it is. Trust, 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 trust. Okay, well, here comes the challenge. Here comes the challenge, and you can't stop it. That'll test you. It'll test that little claim that's easier said than done. Do you really have trust in the universe? Maybe the universe wants to make sure that your claim is true. Maybe the universe doesn't really care whether or not you trust the universe, but the universe knows that since you live inside of it, it is important that you do. And because the universe does have your back, as long as you work hard, that's what luck is, right? As long as you work hard, you're going to make through it. And it wants to remind you that that's the case. There's probably a complimentary uh, statement that might go with, it is what you need, which is you actually have what you need. I made the analogy the other day to Wizard of Oz. All those who sought the wizard to solve their problem, from going back to Kansas to having a brain, a heart, and courage, all found out that they had it in the first place. But what happened in The Wizard of Oz, and what happens in most scripts that are written beautifully? The challenges that are coming towards the character are to exhibition out of them, through great dialogue and experience, the dimensionality of fortitude within the character to succeed against all odds. It is not uncommon for characters to be challenged in a script and fail for the first act or to succeed for a long time and all the music's really upbeat, major key music. It's like happy birthday, it feels good and then all of a sudden, man, they start getting challenged. There's the earthquake, there's the tidal wave, there's the the murder or whatever it is, and all the music starts going into a minor key, and you start feeling that tension. And by the end of Act 1, you understand why you went to this movie in the first place. You understand the challenge of the whole thing. In The Mandalorian, you have this sort of self-important, narcissistic dude who lives for the way or whatever. He's just a bounty hunter. He's just getting his own, right? But he's given this little baby, little baby Yoda. And he's supposed to deliver it from point A to point B. But in, he doesn't really care. It's just whatever. It's this little package. I'm going to deliver it. But he falls in love with a little guy who's 50 years old. And when he hands it off, he starts understanding the slime balls that he gave this kid to. And he decides to come back and get the kid. Doesn't even know what he's going to do with this kid. Nobody even knows what species it is. There's some rumors surrounding the kid's purpose in the universe. And the more he explores, the more his mind is blown. And it becomes an imperative that he save this child. The challenge is exactly what he needed. And the kid has his own challenges as well. Everybody in a good script has this. But that doesn't, that's a movie and it doesn't apply to you. Is kind of what we think sometimes, right? I'm going to bring you to another film where you were a participant in the audience and virtually every single one of you have seen this film. If you haven't seen this film, then shame on you, naughty, naughty, go see it. Indiana Jones 3 with Sean Connery and, of course, Harrison Ford. What's the premise of the movie? Well, Indiana Jones has to find the Holy Grail. That's the point of his mission. So there's a point when he gets to the great treasury, that building built into the side, 
Then he's got to go inside. And inside, we learn that he has three tests he, have to, he has to pass. Now, I want you to think about your Indiana Jones. And these tests, of the tests that you are given, the tests that you need. But what was the difference in the context of you watching Indiana Jones vicariously living through him as he goes through these tests? Remember, the, one of the first tests was, uh, the clue was, only the penitent man will pass. And he's looking at this wild floor. Penitent man, penitent man. A penitent man is humble. A penitent man will kneel. And so he kneels, he bows, and the blades come out of the, out of the wall and just miss his head. Just miss cut, cutting his head off. What's the difference between Indiana Jones going through the three different... Uh, challenges to get to the Templar who was, you know, protecting the grail. He knew it was a test. He had a clear reward at the end of his journey if he were just to be able to pass the three tests. So it's easier, as insurmountably difficult and clever these, these life-threatening three tests were, because if you weren't worthy, you weren't going to get to that dude in the room. You sure as hell weren't going to drink from the uh, the vessel. He needed to save his father's life, who I believe was shot in the gut. So he had no choice. It was either going to be him and his father dead, or it was going to be him surviving and his father surviving as well. So the only difference between our life and Indiana Jones's life is that you knew explicitly in the film that this was a test. So it's okay. Makes sense. You're eager to solve the mystery. Mm, but when it's your life, how eager are you to recognize, for one, that what you're being thrown is indeed a test? And then you can sit for a split second and analyze it going, wow, what does this mean? If your life's going to be changed, right? Like I told you, one of our listeners is moving from an area, and uh, he has two homes, and, and there's one that's in an area where politically and spiritually he is in a completely different plane than most of the residents there. So because of that challenge, he has chosen to, you know, consider selling that place and living in his other place, which is in a much more aligned group of people. Okay, well, that's a tough one, man, because the one he's giving up, as he described it to me, is a lot more, I think, cosmetically appealing based on a certain perspective, which he agrees with, and I agree with too. The city of Sodom and the city of Gomorrah, right? What if you're in those cities, and those cities are not aligned with who you are, and you're seeing the debauchery, and you're seeing whatever it is, the the extremism, you're seeing the poor management of that city? Well, unless you're in some huge capacity, uh, perhaps a multimillionaire, billionaire, and you could initialize uh, or initiate uh, projects and groups to clean the place up and actually fix the problem, which very few human beings on earth will ever be in that position, then you have to make the change. You would have to do what? Trust the universe. Understand that you're preserving probably the alignment of your spiritual soul because you are trying to keep your soul from getting corrupted. You're trying not to take the knee to the dominator of insanity. Sometimes it doesn't have that much context to it. It could simply be, you got to move. Your place is no longer available. You got to move. Time to trust the universe. Time to realize, well, because this is the thing I realized, which was, We oversell ourselves the notion that the experience we're having right now was so meticulously put together that you couldn't put together another one. A lot of times this shows its face in relationships. You are dating someone, married to someone, whatever the case might be. And they're great. At least at first they were great. Things start falling apart and you're thinking, oh my God, I can never replace this person. Kid from my hometown, I think he found out that his spouse was not being faithful to him. They get a divorce. He had a really hard six months on Facebook. He was posting things I would never post in a million years. But God bless him. He was just being transparent to everybody. Seemed to be fairly suicidal in some of his posts without putting it on point. Well, 
as I always say, time heals all. It is not the challenge we want to hear, but it is the truth. And so now, he's moving around the universe. He realized he was a fabulous photographer. This dude's really amazing. I grew up in a photography, professional photography family. I love taking images myself. And this kid, this guy's great. So he's found a new love to distract himself. He's finding out what he's made out of. But had he not lost his marriage, which is hard to contemplate whether or not, you know, you, you don't want to think, well, the universe sabotaged my marriage. That makes you, that makes the universe capable of being perceived as your arch enemy. It could have been that the universe looked at the relationship at the very beginning and says, well, you know, you're more than happy. We're more than happy to let you marry whoever you want. There's no rules about that. We're never going to stop that. But this was really never as amazing as you portrayed it inside your mind. And eventually, because sometimes people grow closer together as time goes on, and sometimes they grow apart as time goes on. His situation might have been more grow apart. And so there was an obligatory moment, and a, a moment when this was going to happen regardless of what he ever did to that relationship. But there was potentially a possibility where he might have recognized the weakness between the two of them and addressed it in a conversation in such a way that he said the magic words and got her to see it. As uh, was it Christopher Walken got Natalie Wood to see that their divorce inside the movie Brainstorm, her last film, was really just based on a huge group of misunderstandings. If you haven't seen that movie, you are in for a treat. Brainstorm. I want you to experiment, if you can, with seeing anything that you experience, whether it be positive or negative, as a challenge. Something to help you. It's, let's say it's a posit positive thing. So all of you are experiencing is a way to appreciate what you have. For those of us who have been on top of the world at times, which I think virtually every human being, eh, probably by 40 years old, you've had at least one peak moment in your life. Today, I feel sorry for the kids who were younger. I send to you all my prayers of positivity, all my vibes I can possibly give you to hopefully project a reality to you that is as phenomenal as my life was at times, right? And believe me, I had some challenges. Heartbreaks around the corner all the time in different categories of life. But if I can give you one piece of wisdom as being an older person, it would be that when you finally achieve any sort of plateau or pinnacle of your existence as you have currently amassed it, I want you to do what you can to keep it. If you're in a really good relationship, well, don't just sit on your ass inside the relationship. Try to figure out what makes your relationship wonderful. Try to reinforce it. Tell the other person that you love them. Tell them why you love them. And try to figure out answers that don't sound cliche. There are definitely cliche truths to all relationships. I think you're attractive. I think you are funny. I think you're clever. I think you love me the way I want to be loved. That kind of thing, right? But try to at least come up with and dig up some versions of the answer or of the explanation that have a little bit more meat to them, a little more dimensionality, more attributes. If nothing else, try to come up with these ideas inside your own mind so that you will just exude the appreciation for whatever you have. Because sometimes it's not about putting it on point and going, honey, I love this thing about you. Sometimes people feel uncomfortable about that. But if you can recognize it within yourself, what's going to happen? You're going to probably behave a little bit more appreciative. Do understand that in a normal family in this world, the female usually likes you because you're strong if you're a guy. The guy usually likes you because not only you're strong, but you're feminine too. So there is a normal you know, nuclear family thing. You don't want to start kissing ass so much that you lose sort of the vitality that drew them in in the first place. And I'm going to digress for one second just to insert another little thing in there, which I don't believe I have ever put in any other episode. You want to have a little bit of mystery slash creativity to yourself with your partner. I have found that that is intoxicating for the other person. 
Meaning, as a human being, you always have random positive gifts to give them. Surprises. You researched something and you made something and they're like, what? Did you did you build that? You're like, yeah, totally, man. I went on the internet. I saw this YouTube video. I went down to Home Depot, got the parts or whatever it is, Radio Shack online. Got all these little, I built this little thing. I wrote this movie or whatever it is. I painted this painting to hang in the, in the hallway because you said you like those color schemes. I just did it. You will blow the mind of the other person and they'll be like, whoa, who the hell are you? This is awesome. You're just getting better with every moment. You might even inspire them to do the same thing. But don't be surprised if you're more the entertainer and they're more of the spectator. I mean, come on. There's plenty of successful families in the rock and roll business or music business where the spouse of whatever sex is on stage killing it and the uh, other spouses in the crowd are off, off the, on the side in the wings just going, wow, that's my, that's my significant other right there. They are amazing. But if it's a business thing, if that's the measurement, the metric, then in this particular case we're talking about, your relationship's ironclad. Don't, don't ever <laughs> rest on your laurels, man. Keep that thing fresh, right? But let's say it's, it's due in large part to a financial level of success, something that you've invented, a company that maybe you work for, you're an employee, or you're a business owner, whatever it is. Hunker down. See how you can make it better. Be aggressive. Make that interesting. Because this life that we're living, in my opinion, is not all about the universe creating challenges strictly to you. I mean, that's happening. You're getting what you need. But at the same time, you have the power to challenge yourself. Look at your portfolio of talents that you have that are responsible, in your opinion, for your success. Be meticulous, and if you don't need to, don't rush it. Be slow, be calculated, and if nothing more, you might come back to yourself and go, okay, I did a big analysis on myself to make sure I'm doing what I need to do to keep what I have, and to maybe expand a little bit. Who knows? Who knows what you need? You know what you need, right? But all you do is you come back and you absolutely 100% confirm that what you're doing is right. Maybe you put some mechanisms in place to make sure that you continue doing what you need to do. Look at moments in your life that have made you weak at times and try to get rid of those things. Fortify those regions of your life such that um, you don't lose what you have. One of the big ones in America and I'm sure this is a worldwide epidemic at this point in the world, is you're in a very successful relationship, but you can't keep your eyes off other people. I grew up in a family where my dad was madly in love with my mother, but he would say things at times, appreciating other women, in ways that he didn't say it, like I'm going to suggest in just a second, that would make it a, a, an objective observation. It seems subjective, and almost uh, insulting at times to my mom. She would have to listen to him fawn over another woman. Now, I must repeat, he was madly in love with my mother. Don't get me wrong. He felt privileged to be in that marriage the entire time. But he was a young guy in his 20s. So when I saw that happen, and eventually later confirmed with my mom that that was definitely how that was affecting her, I thought to myself, well, I'm going to be a dude who doesn't let his eyes wander. And I've been, that's just my nature. But when you get older, what's really interesting is that, say you're in your 40s and you're looking at a young person, uh, whether male or female, it doesn't really matter, man. I got no fears of my sexuality. I'll, you know, I'll tell my girlfriend at the time, whatever, that dude's really handsome, man. Is he really cool? He could be an actor. Oh, yeah, it's really cool. Doesn't he look like that, you know, Tom Hardy guy? Oh, yeah, it's really cool. Well, I'll say, man, that, that, that young lady over there is so pretty. Look at her face. Doesn't she look like Aunt So-and-so or a friend back in our hometown or whatever it is? Yeah. And it keeps it objective. At times, too, I'll reflect after making a statement like that and I'll look over at my girlfriend. I'll say, you know, I'm just... So glad you got your mother's eyes. Those beautiful hawk eyes. I love those eyes, you know. And then all of a sudden, ooh, you know, I got a little something too. You're just being observant. 
So those little fine-tuning details about how you're doing things. Let's say you are a business owner. Well, it's very, very, very important that you, like Alex said in uh, Clockwork Orange, a good leader knows when to like give and take. Very, very important. You can't let your employees think you're a pushover because they won't work as hard and they'll take your money every day. You've been there. Guarantee you've been there in your lifetime. So it's important to keep a stern hand, keep the keep the deadlines in everyone's head. How are we doing on this deadline? Well, you know, we can't slip, so we're going to have to put some more effort in, blah, blah, blah. But it's also good to turn around and go, I just want you to know that artwork you created is utterly phenomenal. We keep this up, and we're going to be very, very successful. And the other one, too, is to share the spoils, if possible, from time to time. But just like when they train dogs for military or police, it was always a mind blower when I was young that they didn't give a treat, a food treat to an animal when they did something right. And when, you know, whatever I was watching explained it, it was like, well, this dog would be overweight, diabetic, and probably die if we fed it something every single time it did something right. And so they trained the dogs to like what? A toy, usually a little ball. It's all it takes, man. You did something right, here's the ball. Boom, bring it back to me. And they love playing catch, man. Boom. So that's something else you can do inside an employment situation where you don't reward with money constantly. Let the rewards for money be a specific event that, that generated a tremendous amount of, for the, amount of money for the company. Or it is a Christmas bonus or something like that. Christmas bonuses can be a little more difficult to pass out if you have a variable team, right? Just giving you some practical applications to some of this stuff. So you might be able to apply it metaphorically back to your life if it works. Electronic Arts, video game company that I work for. There was a time in the, in the mid-90s where each individual game had a team, of course, and that team worked on that game for anywhere from 18 months to three years. If the team made a great game and it made a ton of money, there was a percentage point that was pulled off the profits or the gross net, I guess, and given to the employees. Probably profit, right? The company can write it off at that point. They pay less taxes. It's just the way it works, man. So if you, you were inspired at that point to do a really good job because you had a check coming if you did a good job. Then they wanted to reduce the amount of payment and they got evil. So they made it a department-wide bonus. Well, that means that everyone looking around going, why are we making that game? That game sucks. And it's got, what, five guys on it? it going to How long is it going to take to make it? Two years? That's now coming out of everyone's profit. And guess what? <laughs> Unless the game is released and makes money, it's a, uh, it's a cost center. It's taking money out of the company until it's released. So as a department level thing, it's yanking down the profits for people releasing their great game. Yeah, sure, if you're not releasing your game, you might be happy to get a check off someone else's project. But if one tanks with an expense of 2 or 3 to $10 million of expense, but someone else releases a game that made $10, $20 million, they're not going to get as much profit for their work. One of the most famous situations in gaming history in the last 15 years is when Call of Duty finally went into like super modern warfare. The company that made the game, that then got distributed, I believe by Electronic Arts, or Activision, I think, they paid their employees properly. Some employees got checks, I heard, as high as $350,000, which is mind-blowing, okay? Now, sometimes that can turn into the Turkish prison thing. You get so much money, you don't work as hard on the next one. Sometimes those projects take so much out of you, that you, no matter what the money is, you don't go for the second round and you leave the company or you get on a different project. Again, I was at a, um, I was at a Blade Runner event here in Los Angeles meeting one of the producers who had just written a book. And so I'm outside after it's over and I'm getting my car. I'm waiting for the valley to bring my car. And there was two cinematographers from Avatar. And this is like maybe 2009. 
2008, 2009. So Avatar had just come out, blown away everyone, made a tremendous amount of money. But these two guys behind me were cinematographers. There's four or five of them. And they're talking to each other. I'm just listening. I didn't, I didn't engage them. But I think they said something like, you know, they had 125 babies born out of all the staff members that worked on the project. That's how long it took. But both of them agreed. Because one of them said to the other one, well, if he does another one, if he does a sequel anytime soon, will you take up the job again if he offers it to you? And the one dude said, you know, uh, I don't think so. That was so grueling. I, I'll skip one. Maybe I'll come in on the next one. So we won't do Avatar 2. We'll do Avatar 3. Now, it was, it's been, uh, what, 2007. So we're almost at 15 years now. And he's making 2, 3, 4, and 5. So they may be on the project. But you got to take rests is the point of the game. They understood their limitations. They understood if they went in, they wouldn't be bringing their number one game. Because they are literally exhausted at that point in time. If you can see what I'm trying to say here, that, that life is potentially made out of very intentional challenges. One, it calls out to the software that is the universe itself, that it is brilliantly watching what you're doing. There's not necessarily Greek gods up there putting challenges into the stadium to challenge your life. The software that is the universe can see what you're doing, and it knows to upgrade you in a particular direction constantly. Because it is what all souls want. What that is, well, we can debate that in another episode. Again, just to finish up so you see this clearly in your mind. What's the difference between your life getting challenges every single day, whether they be minute ones or gigantic obtuse ones, and you watching the closing act of Indiana Jones 3? One is a movie, and you know there are three challenges. You know what the benefits are of passing those three challenges. He gets to the Holy Grail, brings it to his father, pours the water on the wound, and makes it disappear, thus bringing his father back to life. I think Sean was dead. can't remember. So that makes clear, concise sense to you. What's, difference in, what's the difference with your life? You just don't have, you're not in a movie theater. You're not eating red vines or, or uh, Twizzlers and eating popcorn and drinking a soda. That's the only difference. Unless you change your mind about how it's all interpreted. That may be all that needs to happen. And believe me, we know we're in a world right now with ridiculous challenges. Some people are cowarding down to the pressures of the world and doing very foolish things with their bodies. And others are holding out. Like, look, this is way too fast. Groups that have never cared about me in my entire life all of a sudden care about me. But every other metric of caring in the same genre that they're coming at me with, they're charging us more money for that same care. And nobody, you know, wants to be a part of helping other people at the same institutions. Quite the opposite in some cases. So we're going to be, there's, a, I think, a bunch of us that feel like there's a calling. You know, and I made a I made a statement. I, I listened to the last episode again. I want to clarify because <laughs> I've been very clear about this, but I want to make sure, just for the sake of respecting valor, I grew up in a military family until, geez, I mean, we weren't out of the military realm until probably '83. So my life was on and off military, but you know, for three years solid in that particular realm, I definitely experienced, I cleaned out barracks and did all kinds of stuff. So when I said I was in the military, I said, when I was in the military, that's what I said in the last episode, I did not enlist. I was not in the military. I was not a soldier. No one said anything, but I want to make sure that you understand what I was saying was my childhood life in the military, watching the, the heroes walk around me, my dad's friends uh, who were OG dudes. Um, that's where I learned how that particular thing functions. So I just want to be clear about that. So give it some thought and definitely give me your thoughts. I will say that, you know, the one reason why I want to gravitate to a military statement is that, you know, there's a lot of us that didn't join the military because it was a peacetime when I was a kid. There was no, like, quick help us fight the enemy kind of thing. And then God didn't fall for that for the last several things that have occurred in this world. And God bless every person who did. 
But there are new soldiers, right? As General Flynn said, the cyber soldiers are the ones. And he's talking about something slightly different, but we know that passing information around to help the world grow is probably one of the most valuable, rare commodities that, that are out there. And so my statement to you is, let's, I'm, I'm 52 at the end of this month. Okay, great. They wouldn't even take me if I went in and, and I found like, if I thought there was something noble to fight for, right? Maybe in like some huge cataclysmic thing that's going on, maybe I could help out. But the game today is to do what you can for humanity. You have solutions that you have figured out for yourself that may not work for me personally. Maybe something I already know. But for someone else, they'll read your comment in, in YouTube They'll read your comment in uh, what is it, iTunes, whatever it is. Wherever there's a comment system as a result of me posting these videos and go to deepthoughtsradio.com to find all the different places. There's only really two big tech organizations, well, I guess maybe three that I rely on. I don't rely on them, but obviously YouTube. We know how to keep them happy and still get our message across. Uh, there's a locked Facebook group, which means you can post anything you want and none of your friends or your employers can see it unless they push into the system. Twitter, I'm experimenting with how that thing works just for the sake of experimenting. But other than those three sources, there's there's Getter, there's Minds.com, 107Daily, Gab.com. So there are other alternatives where you can get out there, but you can spread your message and help others. You can say, man, I had the same thing, man, and blah, 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 blah. This was my problem. And explain your answer in the most metaphorical way you can, thus reducing it down from the specificity of what you experienced and free it up to be a generic truth for all folks. And maybe it's a passage out of the Bible that changed your life. Maybe it's out of some guru's book. You watched a YouTube video and some, some uh, soccer mom somewhere said something utterly brilliant. You're like, that was it. That's all I needed to have. Or I posted a comment and they posted a reply and poof, my, my solution came to me. Be a warrior for truth. You know, there's a thing I always say and people don't know what I'm saying. In fact, very religious people have never heard of it either. And it's all because of like role-playing games. Dungeons and Dragons was the first time I ever saw this class of person. And it's called a paladin. And a paladin is sort of like a Templar. Of course, Templars come with a bunch of other Messianic stuff. But it, it is being a warrior for God. Well, in this particular case, it could be a warrior for truth. The universe, right? Again, when you think things that are true, you have a cool, beautiful sensation inside your soul. You can feel it when you speak the truth. When you lie... Boy, it is all those little bits that were positives turned negatives inside your system. I'm not a big fan of Rosie O'Donnell, but it was a rumor that she told her kids that you know what happens to liars? They catch cancer and they die of it. Okay, well, you know what? That, reduced to a metaphor, I think is spot on, man. When you lie, your body knows it. Your soul cries when you lie. Now, there's a difference between Santa Claus and Tooth Fairy stuff and what we're talking about here. We're talking about true evil deception to get ahead, especially. Now, if you got to save your life and some Nazis got a gun in your face and you're like, yes, I, you know, it just depends on your beliefs. You may not, you know, deny God's existence. Maybe that's something really important to you. But to get to the next level where you're like, I just needed to exit the room to save my life. I'll say whatever that is idiot needs to hear. I think you feel me. So if you haven't gone to deepthoughtsradio.com, this is a really good climate to get in there and bookmark it because we have a tremendous amount of options today. Let's see, all those social media places I mentioned are there. Now for video, we've got uh, YouTube, obviously. We've got bitshoot.com. That's B-I-T-C-H-U-T-E. Just go to the website, click it. Every single episode's up there in 1080p. So they're, they're great. Odyssey, A-D-Y-S-E-E.com. 
It used to be lbry.com or .tv or whatever it is. All that's moved over to Odyssey. Odyssey is a gorgeous interface of like these beautiful blacks and purples. It's really cool. They mirror everything that comes off the YouTube channel. So they are missing season one that's been remastered over to its other channel. And they're missing the videos that we've had to clip to stay on YouTube, which again are videos that were already marked unlisted. I haven't had any videos um, elected to be removed where I was like, damn it, you know, what, a, what this is ridiculous. You're censoring me. No, really haven't had that. And again, if I want you to see it, it's on bitshoot.com, but just go to the website and there's everything there. A big category list on the uh, right side. If you're on a mobile phone, just keep scrolling past the first 10 episodes that are up there. We also have a store up there with some pretty funny shirts. I'm going to continue creating some funny stuff. The beautiful thing about the funny t-shirts, there's one up there for bullshit, uh, billions of served. looks like a McDonald's sign with the poop uh, emoji on top. But if you're not a person that wants to carry around a dirty word on your chest, I made a separate version called Propaganda, Billions Served. The beautiful thing about that is it'll start the conversation. You put it on, boom. I got one that says big UFO in the front from the season uh, five. It says, you know, let's talk about UFOs. It just allows you to exude what you believe and what is fun for you to talk about with others. And believe me, you want to talk about it if you're interested in it. So these shirts are designed to, one, you know, if you said propaganda, well, you know, maybe they believe that you think it's a right propaganda. Maybe you think it's a left. Both left and a right person, if they were into those paradigms, could wear it and have their respective conversations. It just gets the juices flowing, you know. We also have Patreon and PayPal, folks. So PayPal is just where you could just send a, a little donation to the store. I mean, to me, excuse me, to the show itself. And then with Patreon, it has some cool features to it where, one, getting the credits forever. Two, you get the episodes 12 hours to three days before everybody else. Uh, there's also a whole slew. There's 10 fireside chats up there for folks where I'm telling you what's going on. Uh, with the show, with my life, we just chit chat. You also get the podcast of those hidden shows. So I just give you the direct link to the MP3. You just throw it in your phone and it's ready to rock and roll. And we've done some uh, FaceTime too with folks. So for those who were interested in doing FaceTime, we've done it and we will continue doing it. So again, I appreciate all of you folks. It makes a big difference in these crazy weird times as I build a new business to replace or at least fortify what I was doing before. So anyway, take care of yourself and someone else, and I'll see you on the next Deep Thoughts. Over now.